thank you, and what a wonderful introduction. Let me apologize for my voice. I'm on the tail end of a head cold. Um, if it was yesterday, I don't think I could talk, but I think I'm meddling enough today uh, to give you a lecture. Uh, and hear your questions, which is so important. I mean, there's so much to talk about, as you agree, and uh, I'm going to go through the way I see a lot of things, rather quickly through some of these slides, um, and then I want to hear from you. What, your, what, what are your concerns? What are your questions? Uh, and we can go on from there. All right, so let's get right to the, the first chart, which is the, always my first chart. Long run returns, major financial assets. This is what I did 20 years ago, first edition, stocks for the long run. Stocks going all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century. Bonds, treasury bills. This is all measured after inflation, 215 years. Gold, so you see a single dollar in stocks goes to 1.3 million. A single dollar in gold after inflation goes to $3.26. Better than the dollar, which has depreciated. Um, but look at that stock line. This is on logarithmic scale. Straight line represents a constant after inflation rate of return. Look at the regression line through there. Wow. That's what gave me the idea. Stocks for the long run. See all those wiggles? Bear markets, bull markets. Stocks are the most volatile asset class in the short run, but the most stable asset class in the long run. Let me show you the returns over here on the left. Stocks, this is 215 years after inflation. Average annual, 6.8% per year after inflation. Dividends plus capital gains, total return. Bonds three and a half, excuse me, bonds three and a half. Treasury bills, 2.6. Gold, 0 0.5 and dollar depreciating, 1.4% per year. Wow. Let me show you the returns of the major periods. Again, 6.8% per year, compound annual return. 1802 to 1870, 6.7. 1871, 25, 6.6. Six. The Ibbotson period, which was made famous by Roger Ibbotson, the yearbook of Wall Street, 6.8. Since the end of the Second World War, 6.9. That is incredible. Nothing else has that persistence of that long run. 6.8% a year is a number that doubles almost every 10 years. It's a remarkable fact about stocks in the United States. But you're in stocks, your wealth has doubled on average every decade over the last two centuries. Your wealth after inflation in stocks on average has doubled every decade over the last two centuries. That's astounding. And no other asset class can claim that fact. Now there's two very important words in that statement. <coughs> the word on average. Not every decade are you gonna double there are great decades, like right after World War II, we had over 10% per year for 20 years. Then the worst period, 66 to 91, zero, minus 0 0.4. Then the greatest bull market in world history. From 1982 through 99, now that's almost a 20 year period. The average after rate Average after inflation rate of return in stocks averaged 13.6% a year. Now, that's double the number on the top. That's double the long run average, isn't that incredible? It led to, as you'll see later, the most overvalued stock market in history. The peak of the technology and internet bubble in 99 and 2000, and we'll talk more about that later. In fact, from that peak, even though we certainly have had some really good years recently, 
We've only had a 3.9% real return from that particular period. Um, okay, let's look, take a look at international returns. United States is not number one. This is interesting. South, South Africa, over the last 115 years. Now, three British researchers did investigations. After my book, they said, let's look at other stock markets in other countries. They couldn't go back 200 years, of course, but they, I was amazed. They found 17, 18 countries they could go back 100 years. And they measured stock returns, the blue bars, bond returns, the red bars, green bars, treasury bill returns. The United States wasn't number one. South Africa was number one. South Africa has had the best returns. This is all measured in US dollars. Next comes Australia, then the United States. Here's the world. <clears throat> about five and a half percent per year after inflation. Those countries that did worse on the right, on stocks, did much worse in bonds. No country over the period have you lost to inflation on average over the period in stocks. In no country in the world in the long run that we have debt have you lost to stocks. Let's talk about valuation, because that's important today. Are we overvalued? Are we not overvalued? Let's take a look. S&P 500, most important single benchmark of valuation is the price earnings ratio. That is the PD ratio of the S&P 500 going over the last 64 years. And by the way, 17.07 is the median. You can see that over here. I think there's a, yeah, there's a little arrow, as you can see. Um, got this off the Bloomberg screen. I know a lot of you have access to that. So here is the median. Yeah, we're above it. I'll talk about that. When do we get really low PE ratios? Double-digit inflation. Actually, if you take out double-digit inflation, average PE ratios, post-war period are closer to 19. Notice that we've gone up, but now we're coming down, and I'll talk about that. Notice, notice also the peak, most overvalued position in March of 2000, when the P-E ratio of the S&P 500 hit 30. <clears throat> so we're 17 today. We're like a little over half of what we were back then. Um, actually, that was a very interesting market because we had technology going at 90 PE and we had everything else going at 20, which wasn't all that unreasonable. Um, bifurcated market, to say the least, that we had. Um, there's been no bubble over the last 10 years, despite what you hear from commentators about the Fed artificially pumping up the market. I always debunk that on TV. I said, that's ridiculous. I mean, the market is supported by earnings. This idea that, you know, it's it propped up by the Fed was, was nonsense, always was nonsense. Um, if you really want to see a bubble, take a look at the PE of NASDAQ, March of 2000, selling at 600 times earnings. Yeah, we're nowhere near that now. And even though NASDAQ, as you know, yesterday hit another all-time high, and its PE is still in the 20s. We'll take a look at that. It's still very reasonable uh, for high, high growth stocks. By the way, this is my prediction for how the graph of Bitcoin will look five years from now. <laughs> what about earnings? Which one should we look at? There's three definitions of earnings. There's firm reported earnings. They kind of make it up, whatever they want to include and not include. Um, that's the earnings of Wall Street, you know, announces every quarter. Um, then there's a pretty, the best definition of earnings, in my opinion, S&P operating earnings, standard and poor operating earnings. They force the firms and their calculation include pension value changes, litigation expenses, option expenses, et cetera, and so on. They used to call that core earnings um, when they came out with the concept. Warren Buffett, by the way, says that's by far the best definition of earnings. 
when he looks at companies, he looks at what's called S&P operating earnings, the way they define it. By the way, just to take a look, well, look at how the earnings have jumped. The S&P operating last year, 124.51. This year, 157.24, an estimate next year, which I think is too high, by the way. I don't think we're gonna get there, but nonetheless, that, when you consider that we're eight months onto a economic cycle, a jump in earnings, now, most of that is a tax cut. Not all of it, but a lot of that's tax cut. Now, then there's gap earnings, generally accepted accounting principles established by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Too conservative, way too conservative. We'll talk about that and what, what's come out of that. Gap earnings mandates write downs of asset impairments, whether the asset is sold or not. Don't does not permit write ups unless the asset is sold. Two thousand seventeen hundred and nine dollars But look at the jump what they're expecting this year, even with that conservative estimate. Actually, it's only ten dollars less than the estimate of operating earnings for those people who love the gap earnings and love to follow that. But let me tell you that for my valuation, I'm taking the middle because I think that represents the best um, earnings. I'll tell you more about gap earnings and how that misleads so many people in the market today in terms of understanding the valuation of the market. Okay, what do we do with the PE ratio based on gap earnings? Well, there's a fundamental proposition in finance. Um, you won't find it in a lot of textbooks. I don't know why because it's the most important um, way to look at returns. You take the price earnings ratio and you flip it around. You get earnings over price. We have a name for that. That's called earnings yield. Now, I'm not gonna prove it here, but I could with you know, blackboard and chalk, a few equations. But it turns out that the earnings yield is the best predictor of real stock market returns three to five years hence. Now, I'm not talking about individual stocks. I'm talking about the market. So you flip the P-E ratio and you get real returns. Now, you've all, many of you know that the average P-E ratio over long periods of time has often been quoted as 15, which is correct. <coughs> One over 15 is 6.7. Have you seen that number before? Yeah. That's only one-tenth away from the average real return in the stock market over the last 215 years. As one person said, oh, that's, that's such a surprise. And I said, no, it's not a surprise. It's exactly what theory would tell you. Flip the P-E ratio and get the real return. By the way, why real? Because stocks are real assets. Do it for the bonds, you get the nominal return, obviously. Just do it for stocks, you get the real return. So we're going to use that to take a look at today's market. When I did this slide a couple days ago, May 31st, the S&P was 2710, it's gone up a couple ticks since then, not much. Stocks were selling 17.2 times this year's earnings, and we're almost in the middle of this year. So, you know, kind of six months back, six months forward. Um, that's 17 to Next year's operating earnings estimates only selling at 15 and a half. Now again, I think next year's is too optimistic, I'll talk about that, but certainly, you know, 17.2. So let us flip 17.2. People ask me, Jeremy, what do you think real return on the market's gonna be three to five years hence? And I said, well, just short of 6%, five and a half to six. Do you see how I get it? Not hard. Um, always puzzles me why well, more people don't do this in terms of looking ahead, you know why? Because from year to year, it doesn't work. Nothing year to year works great. The volatility of the market. You know, people say, oh, Jeremy, is that your prediction one year? No, that's a longer term prediction. You know, it could be up 20%, down 20%, up, down. This is a valuation prediction based on values that are generated today in the market. All right, now, 5.8% real for stocks. If you have a 2% inflation, we're pretty much there. That's 7.8% nominal return. That's almost exactly five percentage points above treasury bonds. 
That difference between treasury bonds and equities is called the equity risk premium, of which a thousand articles have been written. Generally about why is it so high? I, um, the, the truth of the matter is, yeah, today it's really high because the average throughout history is three to three and a half percent. So now we have a huge cushion. The cushion of stocks over bonds is well above its historical average. That's good. Um, so people say, Jeremy, are stocks uh, above their average valuation? Yes, somewhat, slightly. I'll talk a little bit more about how much. But they, bonds are um, over the moon in terms of theirs over valuation. So the difference between stocks and bonds, and by the way, people say, well, why? Why do you keep on emphasizing bonds? Because fixed income is the world's largest asset class. You cannot talk about returns unless you do it relative to interest rates. Everything is benchmarked. Remember, class one, week one of finance, the value of any asset is the present value of all its cash flows. In the numerator are the cash flows. And what's in the denominator? The interest rate. So don't tell me you can price anything. I don't care whether it's real estate, commodities, oil, land, anything outside of interest rates. Right now, given how low interest rates, stocks are really pretty cheap. Now, the question comes, are interest rates going to go back to where we were? And that's what we're going to talk about just a little bit later. By the way, 528 breach, I'm going to tell you how you get that. People say, tell me how that's generated. You're going to get about a 2.3% dividend, a little bit higher than what you have today. 3.5% is going to be real earnings per share growth. Of which 60% of that is caused by buybacks. Interesting. Only 1% is caused by growth in GDP and other factors. Mm -hmm. Almost all of it is the, the dividend and the buyback. But that's fine. I'm a big supporter of buybacks. So I like cash dividends better, but second choice is buybacks. Next thing. Are we going to go back to 15? That's ridiculous. You know, when we talk about the average PE over 215 years being 15, first 150 years, it was very difficult, if possible at all, to index the market. Think about, you know, how would I get the best risk return trade-off? Index the market, every stock, keep it in the right proportion. How much back then, how much transactions cost do you think it would take a year for you to continue to adjust the shares, bid and ask and all the rest? One, one and a half percent a year? Minimum. So you might have been getting six and a half percent off the index. What were you actually getting Realization, five, about. And that's if you really diversified optimally. What is the cost of indexation today? Zero. Basically, anyone with about $5,000 can go and buy spiders, can go to Vanguard, can go to, and get a cap-weighted index index for five basis points could never used to do that. By the way, I can argue that the equivalent PE ratio is 20, right? 20 PE corresponds to 5% real. 5% real now is 15 of what it was 100 years ago. See that? I've actually convinced a lot of skeptics and, and keep on saying going back to 15. I said, you know, I, the more I think about it, Jeremy, you are right on that. I mean, I might not go with you as far as 20, but this idea that you go back to this historical norm is, you know, maybe not right. Um, it doesn't mean that in a year we won't, couldn't go back to 15 or 14 to 13 or whatever. I would, obviously, I'm just talking about where we're going to settle in the long run. Here's the PE ratios. So you can get this off on your Bloomberg too. Typing in three letters, WPE for World PE Ratio. Gives you the PE ratios of all the major markets of the world, 2017, 2018, 2019. Take a look over here. Um, you see the S&P 500, 16.47, 14.97, 14.98, 14.98, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14.99, 14
There's NASDAQ, 21 on this year, 18 on next year. Toronto, 15. Um, here's the Mexican Bolsa. Here's the Bovespa, which is the Brazilian market. Here's Europe. Look at Europe is cheap, 13, 14. Compared to the US, US is about the most expensive here. You go on to Nikkei at 16, Hang Seng, so you have China. You have Hong Kong at 11, 6. This is this year's earnings. Shanghai Composite at 12.65, ASX 200, that's the Australian index, 63. These are all very cheap. I mean, they're, they're at or near the historical level in a world of unbelievably low interest rates. Wow. Remember, half the world's equity capital is outside the United States, and it's pretty cheap now. Don't ignore it in your portfolio. A lot of people say, Jeremy, <coughs> your good friend Bob Schoen, Yale University, he is my close friend. I met him on the first day of graduate work at MIT, 1967. So we have over a half a century of good friendship. 20 years ago, he wrote a path breaking paper with one of his star students, John Campbell. <sighs> A new way to project returns. He said, Jeremy, I like your P.E. ratio, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to take next year's earnings or last year's earnings. I'm going to put in the denominator of my P.E. ratio the average of the last 10 years of earnings. And that usually goes over a business cycle. So his P.E. ratio became known as the cyclically Adjusted, adjusted for cycle means good and bad times, PT ratio, and then shortened to the acronym, the CAPE ratio. Right. And then he used his CAPE ratio to project the real return on the market 10 years from now. He got an amazing R squared of about 40%. Now, some of you might say that's not that much, but let me tell you, in the stock market world, that's, that's very good. No one had done better. And then people fell in love with him <laughs> at that particular point. Um, and especially those that were uh, the more academically oriented of our financial profession, they just said, whoa, this, this is it. This is what I'm going to use um, on the PE ratio. By the way, it is very bearish now. Um, the PE ratio at the end of last year was 33, nearly double the average. He predicted from this ratio, the stock's going to be terrible, only 1.5% real returns going forward. I mentioned all the people that are so enraptured with the Cape Ridge. I mean, it includes Rob Arnott. I mean, I respect these people. Lions Capital, Jeremy Grantham in Boston, GMO, uh, Cliff Asnes of AQR. Andrew Smithers in the UK. The Economist magazine will discuss nothing other than the Cape Ratio. They've written, what, 50 articles in the last 10 years about the stock market, and that's all they will refer to. They've also been uniformly bearish on the stock market over the last five or six years. And of course, completely wrong, as I'll show you why. Yeah. Let's take a look at that Cape Ratio, by the way. There it is. You can see the peak over here in 2000, and I agree, as Bob did, that that's crazy over here. Um, but you know what, you don't get this. So basically, when you're below the mean, you're undervalued. When you're above the mean, you're overvalued. I looked at this and I said, look at how much we're overvalued. Look at how much we're above the mean. In fact, only this little spike in the financial crisis where we below. Something is going on here. This is, of course, means that we're getting very bearish predictions and we have for decades. Just to give you a little bit about how much the bearish predictions are. In 426 of the last 432 months, in the last 36 years, actual returns have exceeded what the Cape forecast has said. There have been only nine months since January 91 when the Cape ratio has been below its mean. 
only nine, and that was in the bottom of the financial crisis. Then it penetrated its mean, oops, get back there, penetrated its mean in May of 2009 when the Dow was 8,500. So it, be, it called the market overvalued in May of 2009 when the Dow was 8,500. Now it's 25,000, and the S&P was 919. Now 2,700. It is called the market overvalued over the last eight, nine years. And all these people, the market over, oh, at first only mildly overvalued, but as time's gone on, increasingly overvalued. Totally wrong. I mean, it, it amazes me how many people still quote and believe so ardently in the Schiller Cape ratio. People ask me that question, and I said, well, you know, I have a hard time explaining why there are still 5,000 people that are members of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> you know, people will believe in it, but these are intelligent people. But I said, it just a minute, Bob is a smart guy. What, what has gone wrong? Let's take a look at that. So I looked at the earnings, and I said, there's these earnings series from 1871 to the present. And I said, whoa, take a look at that last, uh, the financial crisis. Look at how earnings went down. That's, that's much more severe than the Great Depression, which is there, not previously, by the way. That was World War I, where prices went up and down and caused that ratcheting effect. I said, listen, the financial crisis was bad, but nothing like the Great Depression. And by the way, the drop in earnings just before the Great Recession was right after the financial bubble, uh, the, the, the internet bubble, was also the mildest recession in US history and should not have caused that much. I said, Some, something is different about the cycle now. And then it struck me. Bob did his paper in 1996. Two years later, FASB changed its definition of earnings. That's when they went to mark to market earnings. Ooh, let's take a look at some other earnings data. <clears throat> That's Bob's series. How about operating earnings, which I said Warren Buffett and I and many people say is a much better. Look at how much the decline is over here. Now you say, just well, but how does that reflect on the, on the Cape ratio? Remember, Bob has an average of the last 10 years in the denominator. They're unweighted average. So the zeros of the financial crisis, which are just what are, what are down there, by the way, profits were nowhere near zero, really, on a realistic basis, um, are all averaged in the denominator. That's why the ratio is so high. Um, let me take national income and product accounts, which is called NIPA. This is our GDP statistician. Take a look at that, and that also does not go down like that. In fact, I matched both of those series with the severity of the recession, matched perfectly. I redid the CAPE ratio using these other series. This is reported earnings that Bob uses, operating earnings, and NIPA profit, no overvaluation. Then you use national income and product accounts. By the way, a year ago, Justin Lehard on my prompting, actually wrote a Wall Street Journal article about on, on, on NIPA you don't get any overvaluation on the key creation. I wrote a paper that was published two years ago in the Financial Analyst Journal called The Shiller Cape Ratio in New Look. Um, basically, I pointed all this out. Uh, the FHA has emailed me, said this is one of the most downloaded articles they have ever had in their journal. By the way, it was not easy for me to get this into the journal since Cliff Asnes was the referee, <laughs> an ardent supporter of the Cape Ratio. I had a twist and turn, um, but they published it. Um, and basically, I pointed it out. I pointed this out to Bob. He agrees with me. I said, well, Bob, he said, well, Jeremy, I moved on. Um, I said, well, are you as bearish as that? He said, no, I've got almost all my assets and stocks. So, so, but it's a, there's a group out there that just won't, will not give up on the Cape Ratio. Um, in fact, both Asnes um, and 
um, uh, Bob Arnott had to publish in January another piece supporting the cake ratio um, as a way to look at it. Um, uh, that, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it, also, by the way, there's other problems. It's not just that. There's something called the aggregation bias. There's something that's called the, the uh, transaction cost tilt that I talked to you. You have to make an awful lot of adjustments. Market is not overvalued on any sort of a long term basis. But I said, well, that depends on interest rates. Here's the tips, the 10 year tips inflation protected securities, real returns. If you were to ask me what is the biggest shock of the last couple decades, it's the collapse of real interest rates. It's the, I mean, I, I remember our, 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 our Treasury Inflation Protected Securities came out in January 1997. So three weeks before that, a Dow Jones reporter called me and said, Dr. Sable, government you know, is going to put out the 10-year tips. What yield do you think they're going to come out at? And I said, well, you know, I had just written the first edition of stocks for the long run. I said, long run real returns on bonds are 3.5%. I imagine they're going to come out at 3.5%, which is exactly where they came out. And then they kept on going higher and higher. And guess what? In the first few months of 2000, they hit 4.4%. Now, I just, just want you to reflect on something. That was the peak of the internet bubble. What did I say the PE ratio of the stock market was, the S&P 500, at that point? 30. What's one over 30? 3.3%. Stock market was predicting 3.3%. You could have put your money in tips at 4.4. 4. You talk about you, you talk about craziness. You, you talk about overvaluation. You talk about a bubble. Wow. I mean, this is simple. There's nothing. Do you notice I never once talked about earnings growth and all that BS and try to do that. And they, that's, that's ridiculous ways of looking at valuation. You do it from the fund. What does, what are you earning from a dollar's worth of equity? Period. You know, I actually said, we only get 1% from growth. People say, oh, Jeremy, too pessimistic on that. I said, that's history. Um, anyways, look at the collapse. Down to zero, down to negative numbers. Now it's three quarters of 1%. What do you think has caused this collapse? By the way, it's not central banks. The biggest myth on Wall Street is central banks. That's causing the interest rates to be artificially low. No, actually central banks follow the rates down. Follow the financial crisis. After financial crisis, rates are rigged. Why are rates low? Very low inflation. Slow economic growth. The economic growth has been terrible. Job growth has been fantastic. GDP growth has been terrible. And why is there the difference? Productivity growth has been miserable. All right? High private and regulatory demands for liquidity. Increased risk aversion of aging investors. As the, aging, as the investor class gets older and older, they get more risk averse. Also, they're living longer. So they're, saving more, and then last but not least, the negative beta of treasury bonds with risk assets. Now you probably never thought about that. What does a negative beta mean? That means that over the last 10 to 15 years, treasury bonds have been an excellent short-term hedge against stock market fluctuations. Negative beta are assets that move in the opposite direction to the rest of the stock market. So when the stock market goes up, they go down, and the market goes up. These are very desired assets because they're hedge assets. Oh, if I can hedge a movement by buying an asset that moves in the opposite direction, I want it. What is the return on negative beta assets? Extremely low. Let me show you research. By the way, you can see here, actually put out by John Campbell, the student that worked with Schiller on the research on the hit ratio just a couple of years ago. He measured the beta of uh, actually, the five-year nominal bond, you get it even more on the 10-year nominal bond. See how it's gone negative? 
didn't used to be negative, not in the 70s and 80s. It had a positive data, a treasury bond that's going to give you high interest rates, right? You have no So right now, an enormous part of the demand for bonds is just a hedge demand. It's a great short-term hedge. And by the way, it's a short-term hedge. But people love that hedge. I'll, I'll never forget when I was once with a huge producer at billion dollar accounts. He showed me, showed me the portfolio of one of his clients. Had, client had a, a big wad of treasury bonds. And I said, why? Do you think there can be good returns on these? He said, no, there can be terrible returns. Then why do you hold them? He said, I'm going to tell you why I hold them. When the Dow Jones goes down a thousand points, he calls me up and says, Joe, how did we do today? I heard the market didn't do well. He said, no, you're right. Our equities are down about 5%. But guess what? Our treasury bonds are up two points. So our whole portfolio is only down 2% today. And his client says, keep up the good work, and hangs up the phone. Now think about that. Easy way to keep a billion dollar account, isn't it? Oh, it's not really. Well, it is, yes. It's the people who are affected so much by the short run. Uh, but it is a hedge. You know, you buy insurance, you expect to lose. It's become a hedge portfolio. Uh, and, and, and yes, there, there's a lot of behavioral economics in that. Um, all right, so. Wow, this is very important. The downward movement of rates. Um, so the Federal Reserve uses a concept of interest rate called the neutral interest rate. When they're going to set the Fed funds rate, as they're going to do in a couple weeks, go up again, we're going to talk about how it's going to, what's going to happen. Um, the neutral interest rate is an interest rate that is neither expansionary or contraction. It's like the long run rate. It's the just right rate. Now we've been you know, very, very low for a long time. Um, many people said far below the rates we should be. I mean, like artificially low. But Bill Gross, and this is four years ago, following work of one of his associates, Richard Clarita, which is, I'm gonna point out him a little later, said, in one of his monthly newsletters that the idea that the Fed has that the new neutral is four, four and a half percent on Fed funds is wrong. It's only 2%. And with the 2% inflation, it's zero real. He said that could go on for decades. The Fed is never going to tighten anything what they predict they're going to tighten. You just watch. He was dead right on this point. In fact, there were some researchers <clears throat> that um, uh, John Williams, uh, PhD at Stanford, president of the Federal Reserve in San Francisco, with other staff researchers that also worked on what's something called our star, which is the same thing as the neutral Fed funds rate. He plotted it over time and also said, showed it had fallen down to virtually zero. All those things about negative betas, aging investors, risk aversion, regulatory demands for liquidity, which are huge. The shock of the financial crisis means I want to stay liquid. I mean, why did these banks fail? Because they weren't liquid. And they, you know, they levered 50 to 1 against what they thought were AAA assets, which were really just subprime assets. Et cetera, and so on. So everyone is more than the demand is absolutely huge. So they said, you know, the demand is such that we're in a world now where that's about it. Zero after inflation is all you're going to get. Now, many of you have heard of John Taylor very well. I was, I was under Secretary of Treasury. He's a PhD a professor of economics at Stanford. About 20 years ago, he devised a formula that the Fed should use in setting interest rates. It was called the Taylor Rule. Now, the Taylor Rule was predicated very closely on our star, 
which was the after inflation rate of interest that the Fed should hit, which was 2% for decades. All right. He did show that the Fed should have lowered interest rates, as it did during the financial crisis, but that it should have raised it much more. Now, you know how many people were agitating for the Fed to raise rates in 2010, 11, and 12? In fact, they were agitating so much that the Republicans in the House have passed a bill mandating that the Federal Reserve not follow the Taylor Rule, but consider the, uh, the Taylor Rule in the setting of their monetary policy. It has not been passed by the Senate yet. But they said, Fed is just artificially keeping it low. We don't like it. They should follow the Taylor's Rule. The Taylor's Rule showed that it was much, much higher. Well, it's much, much higher if you assume that our star is still 2%. But if, as researchers were beginning to show, it has fallen down to zero, then no, well, you're not, Fed is doing the right thing. You know, and I rise a little bit above two, we'll talk about how high it'll rise, but this idea of going back to four and four and a half, forget it, we're in a different world. We're in a new world. Now, let me just point out a couple of things. Richard Clarita, who was the first prompted Bill Gross about his research, has just been named as vice chair of the Federal Reserve, all right? John Williams, he did his uh, research with Tom Lobach on our star, has now been approved as the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. There is the central bank triumvirate, the chairman, Jay Powell, the vice chair, Richard Clarita, and now the president of the New York Bank, permanent voting member, and also head of the <coughs> Federal Open Market Committee. Um, I was a bit concerned. Jay Powell was the first chairman in over 30 years that has not had an economics degree. He's a very smart man, and he's very knowledgeable on the markets. But a little concerned that he was not up on all this literature. But he has now surrounded himself with people who are completely up on all this literature. And he's the type of guy that will listen. I think we've got a tremendous group there at the top. You know, maybe not quite as good as when I thought Bernanke and uh, Stan Fisher, who was in my graduate class at, at MIT when he was vice chair and all that. I mean, that was also an ex excellent group. But I have no fears about the Fed. Um, surrounded by some very, very good people. By the way, let me just mention to over here, that's the dot plot. As you know, the Fed puts out every quarter. See how it's collapsed the long run? Our star, neutral, down. And one of the reasons, this was the path that the Fed had called over the last five years for increasing rates. They never followed that path because they kept on realizing that our star is not 2% anymore. Of course, if they listened to Bill Gross and they listened to John Williams or Young, they would have realized that four years ago. Fortunately, they never, as soon as they started tightening, they began to see the reaction. They began to say, just a minute here, we're in a different world. It took them a while, but they're there. Actually, they're, um, let me put it over here, they're 2.9%. John Williams just gave a talk and said, it's 2.5. I'm, I'm adding inflation onto that. But now they're in sync. You see where the Fed is going? All right. I'll talk about how, where the Fed is going in just a second. I just, uh, you worried about inversion of the term structure? A lot of people talk about that. Oh, God, we can't ever set the short-term rate above the long-term rate. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. This is a slide I use in my classroom. I still teach macroeconomics, financial markets. I teach that for 46 years, 42 at Wharton, for, at the University of Chicago uh, before then. If you were to take one indicator and one indicator alone that would predict recessions, it is the term structure of interest rates. It is the difference between long and short rates. Before every recession that we have had in the last 65 years, you see these red dots, pink vertical lines are recessions. This is the difference between the 10-year treasury and the 90-day bill. Before every recession, the term structure has either flattened or inverted. Without exception, wow. So are you worried 
Well, right now, um, yeah, we are at a 92 basis point spread. Now you could say, well, just a minute here, but I see between 1970 and the present, it was 190, we're getting down here. I haven't updated in a couple months, we're about here. But I said, yeah, but just a minute. You should compare today with the low inflation period of the 50s and 60s, not the high inflation period of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And you notice that the term structure was much flatter then. The average spread was only 70 basis points, far lower than what we have today. So don't worry, not yet. And by the way, the Fed is very aware. If the Fed keeps on raising rates and they see the 10-year keep on moving down, they'll stop. They'll say, just a minute, the market's telling us something. So, but right now, I see nothing stopping the Fed raising rates. Then we'll give you one slide before we, we go any, um, into what the Fed is going to do. <clears throat> if you're worried about income, here's the S&P 500, and next up was born in March of 1957. The pink line is inflation, consumer price index. The blue line is cash dividends from an S&P index fund. Cash, not stock, nothing about capital gains and everything. Cash dividends, wow, have always stayed ahead of inflation by big margins in high inflation periods, in low inflation periods, and over the last 10 years at a record rate of 10% a year. And by the way, Stocks are still paying out less than half of their earnings as dividends. They can go up much more. If we're for our tax laws and management options and a couple other things, you know, before 1980, firms paid out 70% of their earnings as dividends, and then things changed, and they paid out less. But I'm just showing you there's a lot of room for growth, and they've been excellent. Now, let me give you um, the... In December, Wisdom, he called me up and said, Jeremy, we're having our annual con conference. We would love you to come up and give a forecast. What's going to happen next year? I said, oh my God, you know, from one year, anything can happen. He said, well, take your best shot at what's going to happen. So this is what I said. I said the Fed is going to hike four times. End up at the end of December <coughs> at a range of Fed funds rate of two and a quarter to two and a half. That's three more hikes at every quarter we meet. I said the long bond at the end of the year, it was at about two, four to five, and I said it was gonna end at three and a quarter. Now it's 290. I said the yield curve will be flatter, but it won't be flat. Fed will make sure that that doesn't happen. I said it's going to be a much tougher year for equities, and we were going to have, for the first time in over two years, a stock market correction, which was a 10% drop. I didn't expect it to come so quickly. As you know, it came at the end of January. Um, I said there are three big headwinds for the equity markets this year. The first and foremost are rising interest rates. That is the most important factor that is going to restrain equity movements. Political uncertainties you know, surrounding what Trump is going to do, the likelihood that the Democrats will gain back the House in the November elections, but not the Senate, or what does that do? Um, and then, finally, the fact that their analysts are gonna start bringing down the 2019 estimates, they're way too hot. The tax cut, and I, I'm all supportive of the, the tax cut. Uh, the personal one, is okay, it's not great. I'm talking about the corporate tax cut. It's front loaded. It allows firms to expense capital equipment, but then they lose depreciation further down the line. All right? So people are going to start realizing that they underestimate the effect of the corporate tax cuts. That's why we had such a, you know, you know, we kept, kept on raising it. But next year, I think they're too high. We're, we're just not going to get the growth that's going to give, you know, another 10, 12% earnings rate next time, and they're going to come down. So all those, what does that mean? I said at the end of last year, I think returns on U.S. stocks are going to be 0 to 10% this year, and I still do. I see no reason to change six months later what my projection was. Everything is basically playing out pretty much as I had expected. Let me just mention also, why is the Fed going to continue to tighten five, 
three more times, you saw, you saw the job growth that we had. That's, everyone thought, oh, that's great. Yeah, well, it's too much of a good thing. You can't keep on having 200,000 net jobs created when the population is only providing 100,000. That means the unemployment rate keeps on going down, down, down. As you know, hit, by the way, a 49-year low. They said to tie the other, but if you go to the third decimal point correctly, it was a 49-year low of 3.8%. Yes, I will admit, economists, the Fed, have been surprised that inflation and wage growth has not responded quickly to the unemployment rate falling yet. But let me tell you one empirical fact. Inflation has always followed when the unemployment rate has hit three and a half percent. We're at 3.8 now. At the current rate of job growth of 200,000 a month, we will get to three and a half by the end of autumn, certainly by the end of this year. That has always sparked shortages of workers enough so the competition for wages workers brings their costs above the productivity growth and it gets passed on as inflation. So the Fed must continue to tighten to squeeze that down to 100,000. Has not, is in the process, but has not done that yet. That's by the Fed. I think there's going to be a relatively hawkish statement that's going to come out of that June 21st meeting. It's going to cause a little wobble on equities. And if we continue to have 200,000, you've got to get it on the September meeting and get it on the December meeting. And if that doesn't do it, you're going to get it on March next year. And the rate on 10 years could go above three and a quarter. I'm talking about five, six percent or anything like that. But these are going to challenge equities, especially with the political uncertainties and the downward adjustment in 2019. So there's my outlook. Those are the reasons for my outlook. Um, all I say to all of you who are worried about volatility, hey, you can buy my book and look at this graph. Uh, in the long run, things are okay. Um, despite all the short run volatility that we have. Well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I, I